Hey friends. Um, so today is our last lesson of transformations, lesson five, and we're going to talk about inverse of a relation. Now, um, we've actually dealt with this a little bit already because we've talked about diagonal reflections, okay? And when I take the inverse of something, um, I am actually diagonally reflecting it on the line y equals x, okay? But what we want to do today is we want to take maybe a little deeper look into more the equation aspect of it, not just the picture aspect of it, okay? So we dealt with the picture aspect of it when we dealt with diagonal reflections. Now we're going to combine that with the equation aspect of it and just kind of what's happening to the equations. So um, remember that an inverse is when we switch x and y coordinates um, of the graph. This also switches the domain and range, which we talked about when we did diagonal reflections. Uh, in transformations, this is the same as reflecting a function about the line y equals x, okay? However, there is a little more detail with inverses that we must pay attention to. Saying that we are switching x and y isn't formal enough. Inverse functions are a special class of functions that undo each other. <clears throat> we have talked in math about inverse operations. Um, the inverse operation of subtraction is addition. Well, why is that the inverse operation? Because one of them undoes the other, right? When you're solving an algebraic um, equation, you're always trying to do inverse operations to undo the thing you're trying to get rid of, okay? So inverse functions are a special class of functions that undo each other. So grab your graphing calculator, uh, graph f of x equals x squared in y1, and f of x equals the root of x in y2, and draw a picture. Uh, you have a graph, uh, a grid below that question, so draw a picture of that. So pause me and do that for a sec. And this is what you should have gotten. Um, this is your x squared, and this is your root of x. Now, if you look at the two graphs, if an inverse is simply switching all the x and y coordinates, I want you to feel like that red graph is not the diagonal reflection of the blue graph. There is something missing here. What's missing, and I think most of you are gonna just see it with your own eyes, but what's missing is this piece right here. And where that comes from, have a quick little talk here. Um, in order to undo a square, you're taking a square root. Well, remember that there's actually a little, um, there's fundamental tiny differences between taking the square root of something and a radical function, okay? By definition, a radical function, which is what this is right now, um, is only the positive version. But when you are taking the square root of something, there's always two answers that are possible, the positive version and the negative version. So to get this missing piece, this missing piece is actually the negative version of the root of x. Okay, so if I add that in, this red and this green line together become the diagonal reflection of the original y equals x squared, which is the blue graph, okay? Now, a couple things I wanna talk about here. First of all, you may look at these pictures and you're gonna have a similar looking picture on your graphing calculator right now. You may look at these pictures and you say, but that looks like the, the width has changed, okay? Um, it looks like this inverse um, graph is skinnier. It's not. What you have to remember is your calculator screen is a rectangle, okay? And right now, I'm going from the same number to the same number on both the x and y, okay? So if I go from negative 10 to 10 on the x, I actually have more room to go from negative 10 to 10 on the x than I do to go from negative 10 to 10 on the y which makes it look like it's stretched out a bit, but that's only because the tick marks are stretched out. The graph itself is the exact same width as the original graph, okay? Now, it says, is the resulting graph a function? So what we're looking at is these two pieces put together, it is not a function. Remember that a function has to pass the vertical line test. If I draw a vertical line anywhere on the graph and it hits more than once, um, it's not a function. Now, what I do want you to see there is the red guy by itself would have been a function, and the green guy by himself also would have been a function, okay? But when I have them together, that is not a function, okay? Okay. 
So the inverse is not a function. It does not pass the vertical line test. A function can only have a single output for every input. OK, what we have to focus on now is making sure our inverse is a function. Now, I want to be really clear with this. We are asking two different questions right now. OK, the first question was draw the inverse. That's what I did on the previous slide. That was the whole shape, and that was perfect. That's the answer to that question, and that's what you need to do. Okay, this is a second line of questioning that we will ask in this uh, unit, in this topic. Um, and what it involves is restricting the domain of the original function. Now, restricting the domain of the original function means I'm only going to look at a piece. Okay, so let's say I only wanted to look at this piece of my original domain. So I'm going to pretend that stuff doesn't exist. Okay, if I did that, I would get out just this piece, and that piece would be a function. Okay, so the restriction that I made there, if you look at that first pink box that I drew, the restriction that I made is I'm going to only look at the original function when x is greater than or equal to zero. And when x is greater than or equal to zero, I'm only going to get the red graph. Um, and the red graph is a function. So I have restricted the domain of the original so that the inverse is also a function. Now, I don't have to do it that way. I could have restricted the domain so that I'm only looking at this piece. If I'm only looking at this piece, now that restrictive domain would be x is less than or equal to zero. Uh, if I did that, my inverse would only be what's in that box. It would only be the green guy. And that would also be a function, OK? Um, again, though, it doesn't have to be right there. That's the easiest spot to do it. And I'll talk about that more in a second. But hey, I could restrict the domain to just this. This is, where did I stop there? Uh, x is less than or equal to negative 2, right? X is, x, x is less than or equal to negative 2. If I did that, I would get a restrictive domain that looks something like that. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make is there's many, many ways I can do this. Okay, what if I restricted the domain to be from negative two to two? Would the inverse of that be a function? The answer is no, the inverse of that would look like this, and that doesn't pass the vertical line test. Okay, so what I need you to see, first of all, the real visual I need you to catch, which is going to make your life a whole lot easier for the rest of this lesson. When you restrict the domain, you want to restrict the domain of the original so that there is no change of direction. Okay, so often when we're dealing with a quadratic, the easiest thing to do is just cut right at the vertex and either say I'm greater than the x value of the vertex or I'm less than the x value of the vertex. Okay, um, it doesn't have to be. That's just the easiest thing to do because the vertex is the change of direction. So if I cut right at the change of direction, I'm guaranteed to not have a change of direction. Okay. All right. So possible restricted domains, I could say x is greater than zero, which was the first one I had given you, or x is less than or equal to zero, which was the second one I gave you. I can include zero in both of those because at zero, I still haven't changed direction. Okay. Consider the three graphs. Draw their inverse relations on the same graph. How could we restrict the domain of the original graph such that their inverses are a function? So again, these are two different questions. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take this and draw the inverse. So this is negative 4, 0. It would become the point 0, negative 4. So it would come down there. This is 0, 4. It would become the point 4, 0. This is 4, 0. It would become the point zero four so if i plot those three and then reconnect them you would get something that looks like this now that is not a function but if the question just said draw the inverse that's perfect okay now i want to restrict the domain of the original so that the inverse is a function now if you were paying attention to the last example some of you may right away say okay piece of cake i'm just gonna go and do this um, sorry, I meant that to be a square, but that's okay. I'm going to go and restrict it to there. So I'm going to say x is greater than zero. There's a problem with that. And I want you to tell me what the problem with that is. Um, did you figure it out? 
the problem is I, I can't say x is greater than zero because my original domain is not x is greater than zero. My original domain would have to stop at four. So if I really wanted to do that, um, I would have to say, okay, x is between zero and four. If I went between zero and four, that would be okay. That would be a good restrictive domain. I could also say x is between negative four and zero. That would also be a fine restrictive domain, okay? So those are the two examples that I've given you here. Restrictive domain could be from negative four to zero or from zero to four, okay? Could be from negative four to negative three too, right? Could I restrict the domain to be from negative four to negative three? Would the inverse of that be a function? Yes, it would, okay? The trick is you don't want your restrictive domain to include the change of direction. So any sort of vertice you don't want to include. Okay, the next picture you're given is this guy. Again, you're gonna find some friendly points. I've got the point zero one here. So that would become the point one zero. Uh, I've got the point one two, that would become the point two one. I've got the point negative one two, that would become the point two negative one. So when I go and plot those, I get a graph that looks like that. Okay, so your inverse function or your inverse uh, relation should look like that pink graph that you see. Again, we want to restrict the restrict the domain. So again, I'm just going to pick on the vertex because that's the easiest thing to do. If I restrict the domain, I could say x is greater than zero, or I could say x is less than zero. Both of those would be fine. Okay, don't get caught into thinking that it's always zero too. It just happens to be that in these first examples that I've given you, the x value at the vertex was zero. If the x value of the vertex is five, then you're looking at restricting either on x is greater than five or x is less than five. The other thing is you don't have to tell me both. I'm, I keep telling you both because I'm saying both are acceptable. If you're asked to restrict the domain, you just have to give me one if that works. Okay, you don't have to give me two. Okay, this guy. So again, in order to get the picture, you want to take these original points, uh, switch the x and y coordinates and replot. So this is negative four comma three, that will become the point three negative four. This is negative three comma one, that will become the point one comma negative three. Keep doing that. The resulting picture that you should get should look like that. And then again, Remember, this is um, a diagonal reflection against the line y equals x. If I happen to draw the line y equals x in there for you, just so that you see, um, that's a bad job of that. Three, three, there you go. So that is the line y equals x. And if you tilt your nose so that your nose lines up with that line, you can see that they are reflections of each other, okay? Now, Restrict the domain so that the original is a function. Again, I'm just looking for no change of direction, okay? So this is one that I see right away. I could just say from negative four to negative three, or I could say from negative uh, three to negative one, that would work, or I could say from negative one to one. All of those involve no change of direction, so all of those would be okay. Okay? So make sure your restricted domain does not have a change of direction. That's the big deal there, okay? Okay, there's an easy way to tell if an inverse graph will be a function or not. Now, remember right at the beginning, I took a look at that root x and negative root x as one relation, and I said, hey, this is not a function because it doesn't pass the vertical line test. What we wanna do here is we wanna say, okay, I don't even wanna look at the inverse, I just wanna look at the original. Is there a way I can test the original to know if the inverse is gonna be a function or not? Well, remember that when you take the inverse, everything horizontal switches to vertical and everything vertical switches to horizontal because X becomes Y and Y becomes X. So if the vertical line test is a test on the inverse, that must mean the horizontal line test is a test on the original, okay? Because when I go to take the inverse of a horizontal line, it would become a vertical line and that would be the vertical line test. So 
if I was to draw a horizontal line here, I see that that hits twice. So I know that in the inverse of that, a vertical line is gonna hit twice, which means the inverse of that is not a function. If I did a horizontal line here, it hits twice, so the inverse of that is not a function. And if I did a horizontal line here, the one I chose actually it happened to hit three times. Either way, the inverse is not a function, okay? So there is an easy way to tell if the inverse graph will be a function or not, and it's the horizontal line test. If a horizontal line intersects the function only once, the inverse will be a function. Um, and then we've already tried it out on those graphs. Okay. When the inverse is a function, we denote it with f to the negative one of x. Now, I alluded to this when I originally introduced um, diagonal reflections to you. I said this is another way we represent a diagonal reflection, but I said there's a bunch of rules around it. Well, welcome to the rules. You only write this when the inverse is a function. Okay, you can't write it in function notation like this if the inverse is not a function. Okay, so if the inverse is a function, you have to write it like this. If the inverse is not a function, you can't write it like this, and we'll talk about how, how we will write it uh, in a minute. Okay, so for each of the graphs below, draw the inverse of the function and state two ways that the domain of the function could be restricted so that the inverse is also a function. Okay, so similar to other questions we've already answered, you're gonna pick some points, you're gonna plot them. I switched my X and Y and replot it, and I got a picture that looks like this. Okay, restrictive domain. Again, my original vertex now is not at zero, it was at two. So I said, okay, either X is greater than two or X is less than two. Either one of those would have been okay. Okay, try this guy. Uh, again, you're just gonna take each point, you're gonna replot after you've switched the X and Y's. You should get a picture that looks something like this. And again, if you're unsure of um, the orientation of this, throw in the line. I'm just gonna make sure I do this right. This is at negative four, negative four, and I wanna go to four, four. So throw in the line y equals x, and then tilt your nose, and you can see that they are reflections of each other, okay? Um, so if I want to restrict the domain of the original, I'm just looking for a piece of the original where there would be no change of direction. Again, there's lots of different options here. I chose zero to three, there'd be no change of direction there. And then I chose three to five because there'd be no change of direction there. Be careful with um, a function like, or a function like this that has a start and stop. Um, you can't just say greater than three because the graph doesn't actually exist forever after three. So you have to say three to five um, because the graph doesn't exist past five, okay? How come I didn't use negative two zero as a possible restriction on the domain? Negative two to zero. Great question. Um, sorry, yeah, I think I said negative two. Yeah, so zero to three would have been, yeah. How come I, sorry, how come I neglected to deal with negative two to zero? So you should be yelling at me by this stage. It's because it's a horizontal line. A horizontal line, the inverse of a horizontal line is a vertical line, and a vertical line does not pass the vertical line test. Okay. Okay, so the graph of y equals f of x is shown below. Restrict the domain of f of x so that the inverse is also a function. So now I'm not asking for the drawing, just restricting the domain. Again, just pick any line segment where there's no change of direction. So I could go negative two to one, I could go one to three, or I could go three to four. Okay, I'm writing each of these domains in interval notation. Um, so we go from bottom number to top number. If I can be that number, I use square brackets. If I can't be that number, I'm using curved brackets. Okay, determine the number of invariant points for each of the following transformations. So this guy here, um, what am I doing? Well, I'm replacing x with negative x. So that's a horizontal reflection. If I do a horizontal reflection, this point here 
would not change because that's on the mirror line if I'm doing a horizontal reflection. Now, be careful. I did not ask you what the point was. I asked you how many invariant points. So your answer here is one. There is one invariant point, okay? For the next guy, that's a vertical stretch. Well, if I stretch vertically, what's not changing? Anything on the x-axis is not changing. So I have one, two, three invariant points there. Um, that's a horizontal stretch of one fifth. Again, I'd have one invariant point because my mirror line and my stretch line are the same thing. Then I have this inverse. X equals F of Y means I'm taking the inverse. I'm going to strongly encourage you before you ever make a decision as to what to do there, draw the line in. So remember that the line just means everything equals each other. So I just went from the point negative two, two to the point two, two so that I could see what that line is. And I can see I'm going to intersect that line twice. Okay, so there would be two invariant points for that. Okay. All right, find the inverse of the following functions. Verify your answer graphically. So f of x equals 3x minus 4. Here's what we do. First of all, switch f of x to y. Um, then switch x and y. Because when I take the inverse, x becomes y and y becomes x. Now we're going to solve for y. So in order to solve for y, I'm going to need to add 4 to both sides and divide by 3. And this then is the inverse. Now I have to decide, is this a function or not? If it is a function, I want to switch my y to be f to the negative 1 of x to denote that it's the inverse of f of x. Okay? If it's not a function, um, I can't use f to the negative 1 of x, so I'll switch this y to just be y subscript 2, just to say that it's different than this y here. This one is a function. Um, it's just a line. y equals 1 third x plus 4 over 3, right? That's y equals mx plus b form. Um, so I can use the inverse notation here. Now, it's said to verify graphically, so I plugged all that into my graphing calculator. Um, you will see that the blue graph is my original, the red graph is my um, inverse, and then for fun, I threw in as a third graph y equals x, just so that you could see the line of reflection and you could ensure that those lines are in fact reflected against the line y equals x. Okay. G of x equals x squared minus 1. Same sort of procedure. The first thing I'm going to do is write g of x as y. I'm going to switch my x and y, and now I have to solve for y. So I have to add 1 to both sides, and then I have to square root both sides. A reminder, when you take the square root of something, it could be plus or minus. If you don't have the plus or minus there, your answer is completely wrong. So it's really important that you are paying attention to the details there. Okay? Now, this is not a function because if you have a positive radical and a negative radical, um, the negative radical is essentially the vertical reflection of the positive radical. And so you're always going to get kind of like that C shape, which would not pass the vertical line test. Okay. So this is not a function. I can't say G to the negative one of X here. So I'm just going to have to call it Y2 instead. Okay. So my, and, and again, the reason I'm calling it Y2 is just to distinguish it from this y. They're not the same y there, okay? So y2 equals plus or minus the root of x plus 1. To verify this graphically, this has to go into your graphing calculator as two different equations, one the positive version and one the negative version, and you would get uh, something that looks like this. So the, again, the blue graph is the original, the red graph is my inverse, and then the green graph is um, the line y equals x, just so that you see the mirror line there. Okay, determine the domain and range for both of these. Um, so in the original one, the domain and range were real. And in the x squared minus 1, the domain was real, but the range was uh, greater than negative 1. I just found the vertex there. Um, remember, this is just x squared moved down 1, so the vertex would have been um, at 0, comma negative 1. Okay, how could we find the domain and range for the inverses of f of x and g of x without looking at their graph? A reminder, when I do a diagonal reflection, x becomes y and y becomes x. So the original domain becomes the new range. 
and the original range becomes the new domain. So the domain and range essentially switch. So when we take the inverse, the domain of the original becomes the range of the inverse, and the range of the original becomes the domain of the inverse. Are the inverses you found functions? If they are not, restrict the domain of the original so that the inverse is a function. For the first guy, the inverse was a function, so there's nothing to do there. The second guy, the inverse was not a function, so I need to restrict the domain of the original. Um, easiest thing to do is to cut at the vertex, so I could say x is greater than zero as a restrictive domain, or x is less than zero as a restrictive domain. Okay. Determine the inverse of g of x equals x plus one squared minus six. And then after you've done that, restrict the domain. Okay, well, again, to determine the inverse, change your g of x to y, switch x and y, and now we need to solve for y. We need to isolate y. So I'm gonna add six to both sides. I'm gonna take the square root of both sides. Remember when you take the square root, it could be plus or minus. And then I'd be left with this y plus one, so I subtracted one from both sides. It is not a function, so I denoted it as y subscript two. I can't use that g to the negative one of x because I can only do that when it's a function. Now, restrict the domain. Well, I would love it if you recognize this as vertex form, and you can tell me then that the vertex of the original was at negative one comma negative six. Okay, so the x value at my vertex is at negative one. The easiest thing to do with a quadratic is to cut it at the vertex. So I could say x is greater than negative one or x is less than negative one. So there is my <clears throat> graph and there's my restricted domain. Okay. Let me clear that for you. Given the function f of x equals a comma x minus m squared plus n, uh, restrict the domain of f of x so that the inverse is also a function. Again, it's actually the exact same thing. You're just saying, where's the x value of my vertex? The x value of my vertex is at m right now. So I just say x is less than m or x is greater than m. Okay. So let's summarize. We can find the inverse of a relation by switching the x and y coordinates. The inverse can also be thought of as a diagonal reflection about the line y equals x. The domain of f of x will become the range of the inverse, and the range of f of x will become the domain of the inverse. The horizontal line test is an easy way to tell if the inverse will be a function. Sometimes we must restrict the domain of f of x so that the inverse is also a function. When the inverse is also a function, we would use the notation f to the negative one of x or g to the negative one of x or h to the negative one of x, like whatever the original function was. Invariant points for inverses are on the line y equals x and always draw this line. Um, draw it in carefully so that you can see the intersection points of the original function with the mirror line. Okay, remember that not every intersection point of the original function and the new relation uh, are going to be invariant points. It's only when they hit the mirror line. So it's always better to draw that mirror line in. All right, so this is your task now. Um, have fun with it. Of course you'll have fun with it. It's math, how can you not have fun with it? Um, but come see me if you have any questions. Take care guys, have a great day.